make the mistake of thinking that if you're committed to naturalism, you're committed to physicalism because of the old idea of the dream of reduction. But if there isn't reduction, which there isn't, you're committed to all of the posits of all the different sciences you have. And that can vary depending on how many sciences you allow in your mix, right? You can say just the natural sciences, you can add in the social sciences. Okay. Um, now, the sciences, they come in very many varieties, right? There's many kinds of sciences, uh, the human sciences, the social sciences, uh, the natural sciences. There's many kinds of science, and you've got to take that plurality seriously as a matter of fact. That's just the situation. If you're, a, if you're a scientist about science, one of the first things you notice is it's not unified and it's very multi-level, multi-dimensional. Okay, what do these sciences have in common? I think they do have something in common. And here I'd want to distinguish what the Germans call uh, science, you know, Wissenschaft, German term for that. That just means a system of knowledge. So keep that aside. That's not the relevant notion for us. The relevant notion of science is, let me just uh, read this out because I sort of put it down. All sciences attempt to achieve, and every word here matters, an objective account, an objective account, of the causal structure of the world. So that causal structure could be the laws of physics, so that that's universal laws, or it could be the local causal patterns in sociology or in economics, like you know, the local causal patterns in some market or other. Right? So I'm supposing that what science is, science is interested in causal structure. Causal structure comes in various varieties, various things, you know, you can get the laws of physics, the local causal patterns, and it's objective. It's got to be objective. Right? Now I'll explain a little bit about objective now. So that's what science is, and that's what all the sciences do. And a lot of the sciences, as you know, are, their, their business is to empirically investigate what correlates with what. And the reason they do that is because they're looking for a causal story to tell. If, so if two things are correlated, maybe one causes the other in one direction or another, or maybe they're both caused by some other thing. But you're, you're always interested in correlation, because you're looking for the cause. Okay. Science is an objective inquiry in this sense, so it's an objective in a strong sense of objective. And it, this really matters a lot now, for me, for my, what I'm going to say today. Um, it depends on a conception of the data, the data for science, like what you regard as the evidence, the stuff that you're using to then go on to uh, explain. Like, what is the phenomena? What's the data, right? Well. Science has to, ha has to have a, a certain notion of what that data is, and it does. And that is, it has to be able, that data has to ha allow for impersonal identification and impersonal verification. That's to say that any inquirer who asks the relevant question must be able to get their hands on that data. And if, if it's a result of an experiment or a test or something, that it must be that all the inquirers who look at that, that result will come up with the same answer. They'll say, well, it's, it's this or that. And it doesn't depend on your own psychology. It doesn't depend on your, what you had for breakfast. It doesn't depend on uh, what your taste in art or your moral predilections or your sexual life or anything like that, your gender. It doesn't depend on any of that. Your, your race, it just depends on the fact that you're a reasoner with an ordinary human capacity for perception and memory and so on and so forth, and that you can identify the data and verify the results of the experiments and tests you do. So it's an impersonal inquiry. That's very important. Impersonal. So it follows from that that the fact that it's an objective study that you can say the following, and this is what I do want to say, is that science as an objective study of the causal structure of reality, causal structures, actually I put a plural there, but that's, we don't need to go into that. It's, a, it's an abstraction. Science provides an abstraction from a richer world made available by, of course I'm now going to say, subjective experience. Subjective experience including intersubjective experience. Where two subjectivities agree, let's suppose. 
but bring subjectivity back in and you have a richer world. I'm going to now say, that's my, that's my claim. So science abstracts away from a world that has both subjective experience and you might say the capacity for or the chance for an objective study, which is what science is. But science, in order to have science, you have to take those subjective experiences and find a way of abstracting out something which we regard as objective. Right? So something impersonal. Out of something that starts personally. It starts in the personal subjective realm and you have to find a way to get to the objective. That means that you have a richer conception of the world just to start off with which, when you do science, you have to be abstracting away from. You're always leaving a fair bit of that out in order to do the objective, impersonal study that is science. You're always leaving that aside. So I just want to now call attention to what you're leaving aside. Because there is stuff there. There's quite a lot of stuff there. And we've only overlooked it because science has been made, science has been worshipped, unfortunately, in philosophy, as if it were a metaphysics, as if it, as if science provides that if without God and without theistic metaphysics and without the purely a priori metaphysics of the past, science has seemed to many people to be the new metaphysics. And I just want to say, don't do that. Don't treat science as metaphysics. Just treat science as science, as what it is, an objective you know, inquiry into the causal structures of reality. Good stuff, but I mean, don't turn it into metaphysics. Don't say it's everything. And don't say it's all reducible to one thing. And you know, there's all these myths in philosophy about science understood as metaphysics, which is what I'm trying to move away from. But in any case, <coughs> subjective experience does reveal to us a whole bunch of what I'm going to call non-scientific objects or items. Now, when I call them that, be very aware that all these things are able to be studied by the sciences. I'm not saying these things are non-scientific because they cannot be studied by science. Yeah, they can be studied by science, so long as you abstract away from the subjective experiences under which they are understood in everyday life. So, you can understand, say, a chair, or take a chair, you can understand a chair from the point of view of a physicist, right? You can understand a chair from the point of view of a, a chemist. You can understand a chair from the point of view of an economist. No, no problem. All those ways. But what you can't do is understand it as a chair from the point of view of science. There's no science of chairs. There's no science of chairs. Because chairs is not an interesting concept that's understandable at the objective level of the causal structure of reality. It's too interest relative, it's too subjective. What a chair is, is something that functions to sit on, right? It has to serve that purpose and therefore it's wrapped up in a whole bunch of subjectivities so it doesn't feature as a scientific object. So there's no such thing as a science of chairs. This is obvious, but it's funny how people don't seem to notice this. So, what are all these non-scientific things? Non-scientific, by that I just mean that the concept of the thing that it is, is not an objective concept. It's a concept that involves, in one way or another, subjectivity. Ineliminably, it involves subjectivity. Alright, so what are these things? So, here are the things that are non-scientific in that sense. People, you and I. There is no science of people. There is just no science of people. There's sciences that are aspects of us. There's a science of how, you know, our physiology, how we, how we pump blood around the body or, you know, the lymph or whatever. But there is no science of the human as such. There is no science of a person. For lots of reasons. But there is no such thing. There's sciences of lots of bits of us, there's economics, there's physics, chemistry, you know, all those bear on us, of course, bits of us, aspects of us, but not qua person. There is no science of that. So there's no science of us as qua, what you care about, rational agents. Reason itself, there is no science of reason. Let's just, if you want to put it in a nutshell. Human action, human action. There is no science of human action. Human action is real. It's a real thing in the world. Uh, there's a difference between, you know, as Wittgenstein would say, the difference between my arm going up 
and me lifting up my arm or me waving at somebody, you know, one could be, I, if you put electrodes in my arm and then, you know, stimulate them, maybe my arm jerks up, that would be quite different from me waving, even though maybe the say, very same action, very same movement is caused in both cases, but one would be my action and the other one would just be a movement of my arm. Um, art. Art is another thing. There's no science of art. Art is a real thing. There are novels, there's plays, there's, you know, poems. Uh, there's no science of any of those things. You might wonder, why is that? Well, because they're not part of the objective causal structure of reality. They're real. I mean, art exists. It's not supernatural, but it's, there's no science of it. Um, there's no science of reason, as I said before. That's to say, irreducible, conceptually normative items like reasons. There's no science of human history, despite what Marx and Hegel said. <laughs> there is no science of that. There are no laws of history. There's no science of human history. And that's not surprising because there's no science of action. And the human history is just, you know, action with, where you add a lot more people in and you have a lot more time uh, on your hands. And there's no science of ordinary objects like, like chairs or any artifact made for human use. There's not any science of any of those things. Again, I'm not saying you can't do science on those things. You can't, I mean, if you have a pen, you can understand it, what it's made of, and you can do science on all those bits and pieces of it, but that's not a science of pens. It's not laws and predictions about what pens do in the world. No. Because why? Because that's too subjective. That's too interest relative. It's too wrapped up with our purposes, interests, ends. It's too, way too subjective. So, so what I'm trying to draw attention to, I guess, by talking about this non-scientific, non-supernatural realm, is the realm in which you have subjective elements entering into this, this domain. So where there's understanding like this, it's, it's subjective or intersubjective. Where there are objects here, they're subjective or intersubjective. So this is what Husserl calls the life world. It's what Stanley Cavell calls the ordinary. It's what Murray called before the human realm. I like that. It is that realm. And, and it's the realm in which... Um, <coughs> let's go back to Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein, to get his hands on this realm, it's not easy to get your hands on this realm. Um, I'm going to stop soon. Don't worry. Um, the reason it's not, e it's not easy to get your hands on this realm because of the dominance of science today. Everybody has foremost in their mind science. And so think about, like, if I'm trying to talk about this subjective realm that we're in, in ordinary human conversation, where I talk to you and you talk to me. Um, now, I'm interested in what you might call... Now, again, if I say your psychology, see, that's, that's hopeless because the word psychology just seems to presuppose science. And in fact, in philosophy, they don't regard us as having any understanding other than scientific understanding. They say we have folk psychology, i.e. a proto-science, a, a poor man's science, which gets refined into proper science. But I'm saying, no, that's wrong. There is everyday understanding of each other, which is not scientific. It's not folk psychology, and I guess there's no word for what that is. I'll just say our everyday understanding of each other, whatever that is. And I think ordinary human communication takes place in this realm, and if you want to call it anything, I call it the second personal realm, because it's, 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 it's a matter of I, thou relationships, me to you, you to me. And all those, the, the relations we can stand into each other, matter for ordinary human communication and ordinary human understanding. So, Wittgenstein, when he tries to say, uh, talk about a person as not a scientific object, but as not a supernatural object, he still invokes religious language, and this is the trick, not that he believes in the items of religion, but he uses it to suggest this thing is not able to be fully understood from the point of view of science. So he says, when he's talking about another person, he says, my attitude towards him is an attitude towards the soul. Now he says it like that, not because he thinks there are things called immaterial souls. He doesn't believe in that. But he's trying to suggest that my attitude to another person 
my relation, fundamental relation to the other person is not a scientific relation. It's not a relation of prediction and control of them qua objective phenomenon and the causal structure of what the world. I mean, that's how Dan Dennett talks. But Dan Dennett has got this problem. He, he always sees science before the mind and he turns everything into science. I'm saying no, there's something else apart from that. I'm not saying that what he talks about doesn't exist. There, of course, we're, we're causal creatures. We, we are part of the objective causal order of the world. But we're also subjective. We're subjects. We're subjects to other subjects. And we, in our language, define an intersubjective realm of understanding of each other, which is not a matter of prediction and control. Often, just understanding of the person has nothing to do with prediction and control. So we don't even have the same aims as science, oftentimes. Um, so I, I support a thing called liberal naturalism. Liberal naturalism is the philosophical investigation of the space of interpersonal human relationships where I will be interested in all those subjective things that science doesn't have any account of because it leaves them out in its attempt to come up with an objective causal structure of the world. So that's what I mean by saying that I want to qualify the, the adoration of science on your website and say, look, you're leaving out a crucial thing here, which is the, our interpersonal understanding of each other in ordinary human discourse and, and life. And, and also all of the human artifacts and all those things that involve human intentionality, involve human interests, have a human purpose, all those things just get abstracted away from when you do science. So I say, don't think science is everything. It's great. It's wonderful. And I completely agree with Ian when he says, we need scientific in input to understand the problems we have today, ethically, politically, and every other way. I completely agree with that. It's just that it's wrong to think that science is the answer to our problems. So the Wittgenstein point still stands. Wittgenstein could agree with you and say, yes, I'm not saying that the problems of life can't be helped by scientific input. I am saying they're not going to be answered by scientific input. So I would, I would agree with Wittgenstein when he says, what's that thing that... Yeah, we feel that even if all possible scientific questions were answered, the problems of life have still not been touched at all. I agree with that. Because the problems of life are occurring in this intersubjective realm of human understanding that isn't touched by science. Not a matter of science. And I guess that's where I'll leave it. Uh, yeah. That's provocative enough. <laughs> talk about, so we're going to have a Q&A session, but I'll, I'm 